Mental health professionals who own a solo practice may also want to expand into a group practice. This could be for many reasons, but as I've interacted and worked with many practice owners, their desires and values and stage of life may not lend themselves to starting a group practice. I had a practice owner reach out to me recently, and she said she was ready to grow her group practice. And as we started talking, she casually mentioned, oh, there's one big change that's going to be happening with me. Uh, I'm pregnant with triplets. Trying to grow a group practice in her situation may not benefit her personal life at the moment. And being a father of twins, I can guarantee that there will be sleep deprivation for at least the next 14 months, and trying to scale a group practice would be near impossible because scaling a group practice is sort of like giving birth to a baby. It needs time and attention and nourishment. Paul Jarvis, in his book, Company of One, challenges all entrepreneurs around the pursuit of growth. He writes, a company of one is simply a business that questions growth. So would expanding to a group practice be beneficial to your life right now? Will it help you achieve your personal and professional goals? To help you answer these questions, let's dive into the five reasons why you should not start a group practice. The first reason why you may not wanna start a group practice is if your vision and values do not align with a group practice. The vision that you have for your practice in your personal life should dictate what kind of practice you have. I'm a firm believer that your business should serve your personal goals. So have you articulated the goals for your personal life? Have you articulated the vision for your group practice? Is your vision something like to be the number one private practice serving couples in the Denver suburbs and pay off my house in 10 years? Then a group practice may better serve that vision than a solo practice. Or is your vision more like to provide child therapy services in the community and only work three days a week to spend more time with my family. A solo practice may better serve that vision than a group practice. Paul Jarvis, again, in his book, Company of One, he writes, your vision is the lens through which you filter all your business decisions from the tiny to the monumental. So what is your vision for your practice and your personal life? Does this move you to stay in a solo practice or expand to a group practice? This all comes down to understanding your why or your vision for your practice, which I cover in another recent podcast and blog post that you can find on my website. The second reason you may not want to start a group practice is you value simple finances. Starting and growing a group practice comes with many complexities that you may not want to deal with. The complexities that you'll face will be in these three areas finances, operations, and marketing. But let's start with finances. If you're a solo practice, your expenses are very simple. You have your lease, your office expenses and utilities, and you only pay yourself. You may even get away with not even having QuickBooks, and you can just use a simple spreadsheet to track your expenses. When you grow group practice, your finances become more complex. You'll have more expenses as it relates to office space and software, including QuickBooks. You'll eventually need to maybe hire a bookkeeper to keep track of all these things because most likely you'll develop financial blind spots. And believe me, I've seen it happen dozens of times with practice owners. When it comes to money and the growing of your practice, you just will develop financial blind spots that you're just not aware of. You'll need to track client payments from your clinicians, as well as maybe insurance reimbursements. You'll have greater payroll costs and taxes to pay. You can say goodbye to TurboTax because it will no longer help you. And this is just the beginning. Someday you may offer benefits to your team like health and a 401k, which you also need to track and administer. So if you're not feeling overwhelmed by this, then maybe you are cut out to be a group practice owner. But if you cringe thinking about all this, you may want to stay a solo practice. Okay, let's take a look at operations. The third reason you may not want to start a group practice is you value simple operations. Of course, the complexity around how you run your practice grows with a group practice. You'll be doing less clinical work and more management of people and tasks. Operations includes things like staff meetings, case consultations, clinical supervision, buying copier paper or other office supplies, one-to-one meetings with your clinicians. You will be managing employees who have their own complexities. Maybe you'll having to manage a biller, managing an intake coordinator. You'll have to provide training on your electronic health records or how to charge your clients. 
and even HIPAA compliance. You'll be having to create policy manuals and policies around everything, including vacation and how to open and close your office. You may not want to have a group practice if you don't like to manage people and personalities. You may not want a group practice if you'd rather do more clinical work versus clerical work. And you may not want to have a group practice if you'd rather not keep others accountable for their job performance. So if you value simplicity as it relates to how you'd like to run your practice, staying a solo practice may be a great fit for you. Okay, the fourth reason you may not want to start a group practice is if you value simple marketing. But marketing becomes more complex as you bring on more clinicians, more specialties. Most people who go shopping for a therapist go to Google and they type in counselor near me and they look at the review stars and then they go shopping. So what this means for you as a practice owner is that you need to get Google reviews and you need to show up on Google for crucial search terms like counselor near me. With a group practice, you'll also be responsible for attracting new clients to your practice to fill up the clinician's caseload. So there's that added responsibility and complexity to your marketing. So if you value simple marketing, you may not want to start a group practice. The fifth and final reason you may not want to start a group practice is your ability to command private pay prices. A solo practice can command higher pricing power for their services, not in all cases, but in many cases. It comes down to supply and demand. If there's a lot of demand for your services, but you're the only supply to meet that demand, your ability to command private pay prices remains strong. Also, as your brand value grows, so does your ability to raise your rates and even ditch insurance. There's also another reason why you can command higher prices for your services, and that's customer service. People love direct access to the business owner. It doesn't scale, but it's an amazing added value. So just imagine if you had access to the CEO of Apple. You could just go to an Apple store and ask Tim Cook, what's the best iPhone for my child? And you could have a conversation with him about it right there and he can help you. The two powerful pricing options you have as a solo practice is scarcity and access. You only have so much of your time and the access they get is you. And your time is valuable, isn't it? How valuable is it? It's more valuable than you think. If you have an established trusted brand in your community, your ability to remain a private pay practice is high. But if you do not have a solid brand presence, commanding a private pay practice may be difficult. You can still do it, but it takes some time and it can be a roller coaster of emotions. So if you can't stomach the roller coaster of entrepreneurial emotions as it relates to private pay and pricing, you may not wanna start a group practice. It just might make sense for you to remain a solo practice. So here are my concluding thoughts. You want to be certain that starting a group practice is what you want to do. But in order to get to that mindset, you have to know your vision for your business and for your personal life. So you need to ask, can a group practice help you accomplish both? Because working with contractors and employees is a lot of work. Marketing and operating a group practice is a skill that you probably haven't learned yet. And it's a skill that usually happens through trial and error and just experience. At Branch Your Practice, we focus on helping practice owners start and scale their business and to actually overcome those mindsets, get really clear on the vision and mission, and give them a playbook in which they can implement and that we help implement with them to grow that private practice. So if you're ready to start your group practice today, reach out to us. We partner with practice owners to make this a reality for them. If you think my ideas are crazy or I'm missing something, I want to hear about it. Write me at brent at brandyourpractice.com. And if you want to craft a simple vision and mission statement to better answer your why question, check out my blog post, Know Your Why So You Don't Crash and Burn. And there I have some simple formulas for you to be able to create a vision and mission statement. That and I have a ton of free resources on my website, including an updated free private practice launch checklist. I've helped launch over 10 private practices using this launch guide, and we use it every time when we launch a new practice. Thanks for listening, and please subscribe and share our podcast, and join me next time on the Brand Your Practice podcast.